it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jeremy Long as our speaker. Um, this is our third in a row from San Diego State. Um, it is, yes. <laughs> it is the last one for a while. Um, I'm going to be giving a seminar later on, but this is kind of the last of the San Diego um, State triumvirate that came up over the past few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So, <laughs> those of you who uh, uh, don't know Jeremy from WSNs or from uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the raps and the songs, from him. Um, Jeremy got his uh, undergraduate, I have to write this down on a napkin, <laughs> you don't always know the, the pedigree of your even your colleagues and friends. Um, he got his undergraduate from uh, University of San Diego. Um, he did his grad work at Georgia Tech in Marquet's lab. He then did a postdoc at Northeastern in Trussell's lab. And then he came to San Diego State about six years ago and joined us as our chemical ecologist. Um, and I think one of the things that um, I really have liked about uh, Jeremy is this kind of other approach he's taken to outreach and getting students excited and, and different ways of thinking about involving students. And for those of you who go to these conferences, WSN in particular, when you've seen the, the video and the film festivals and stuff, um, you may not have known that Jeremy was incredibly instrumental in getting these in the ideas behind these things. And as you said, Pollock, who is the? the Joe Pollock. Joe yeah. Pollock um, is the one that kind of saw Jeremy's excitement in this and kind of pushed him to get the, and to help some students um, and get these things off the ground. And so um, Jeremy was actually one of the main motivators behind getting these film festivals going. He's also um, has a chemical ecology class at, at San Diego State where the students are required to pick some organism, some sort of a chemical process um, that has to do with the class and then create um, music videos to it and then show those videos. These things are all online and it's, is it Beneath the Waves? They called? Uh, the film festival is Beneath the Waves, and uh, my YouTube channel is separate from that, but you can check out those videos later on for sure. Yeah, they're on, the, you can go to the San Diego State website. I think they're one of the things that are highlighted on it. So um, without any uh, further ado, I'm going to, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jeremy Long. Cool. New Year Six. New Year Six. Um, okay, cool. Thanks everyone for coming out for my talk. Um, the topic of my talk today is going to be the impact of stressors on species interactions. And something you should know about me is that for the past 10 years or so, I've been working in intertidal systems. And as I've been studying them, I've gained an appreciation for how humans are impacting them. And we expect this impact to continue moving into the future. So I think that this is a generally important and interesting question. And my approach is to really start at the level of species interactions because we know that interacting species through competi competition and predation um, can be really important to the, what these communities look like. So here's my sort of shout out slide. Um, the students with the little blurbs coming out from their heads, these are the students that largely contributed to this uh, research today. So I give them mad props. And also I give props to my funding organization. Um, so Matt uh, mentioned that I'm interested in, in sort of using music videos and music to connect science to a broader audience. And so these are some of the people that we've been collaborating with. Um, Generic and Parker are two San Diego hip hop artists that have a vision and want to bring science to a bigger audience. We've got an amazing crew of grad students. We're partnering with film crews and occasionally I sort of pretend that I'm a rapper and you're gonna see some of that in today's um, talk. <laughs> we'll sort of see how that goes. Okay, so generally I'm interested in the impact of stressors on these communities, but in particular I'm really interested in the responses of prey to their predators and how these stressors might impact them. So this is a picture that I borrowed from Benjamin Groupie at um, Scripps from the Oregon Intertidal. And here we've got predators and apparently these sea urchins are responding to this predator by fleeing from that predator. Here's another example that's closer to my sort of um, background. Um, Jeff Trussell has done a lot of work in New England showing that predatory crabs can influence their communities by changing the behavior of snails. And so what you're seeing here are two barnacle tiles. Um, the one on the left was attacked by snails that were afraid. They were exposed to crab cues. You see most of the barnacles are still intact. The one on the right were attacked by snails that were not afraid. So most of the barnacles there were consumed. So the effect of these prey responses can have dramatic effects on these communities. 
So the basic question of the talk that I'll try to address is whether or not stressors affect prey responses, and if they do, how they do. And I'll be focusing on these three major types of responses, um, compensatory growth, inducible defenses, and density-dependent foraging. So we'll start with compensatory growth. Um, <laughs> plants, plants have sort of three major strategies for how they might compensate for herbivory. They can undercompensate, in which case we expect the herbivores to have a negative effect on the plant. They can equally or perfectly compensate, or they can overcompensate. And this is kind of a dramatic example. Um, it's a fairly rare example, but plants under some occasions some situations can actually perform better, maybe grow faster when they're attacked by herbivores. And this idea, I think, was sort of elegantly described in this influential paper where they described the compensatory continuum hypothesis. And it basically says that how plants respond to herbivores depends upon nutrient availability or nutrient stress and the level of competition. So when plants are stressed by low nutrient levels here and high competition, that's when we expect herbivores to have a really strong negative effect on the plant, so under compensation. When nutrients are high, when competition is low, that's when you might get overcompensation. And in a subsequent meta-analysis, um, it was suggested that this effect might depend upon functional group within plants. So here's a meta-analysis showing you that in general, herbivores tend to have negative impacts on plants. Resources tend to have positive impacts, not a surprise. Um, but if you look at this interaction term, it actually tends to be positive for the monocots. That is, under high nutrient conditions, herbivores may actually stimulate these plants to grow better. So we were interested in looking at the generality of this effect. And so we were working in salt marshes. And in salt marshes, it appears that salinity stress might be an important stressor in these systems. And here's a, a diagram of data from a long-term monitoring um, project by Joy Zedler. And here she noticed that over the period between 1989 and 2001, that salinity in some of these estuaries was increasing. I need to put a caveat here. Um, they changed the methodology between these two years. So we're not talking about this massive jump here. We're talking about the rise in salinity from there to there, and then maybe from there to there. What's striking about the change in salinity during this time is that there's also a decrease in the amount of cordgrass um, cover within these marshes. So there's some evidence that in San Diego, salinity is changing. So that might be stressing the plants. And there's also concern that with sea level rise, for example, salinity in these marshes will change. And so we'd like to be able to predict what's going to happen um, moving forward. Um, so we decided to tackle this question by focusing on, focusing on this particular plant herbivore interaction. Um, here what we have is a picture of a blade of Spartina foliosa, and it's being attacked by this specialist Haliaspis spartinae. Haliaspis is a scale insect, meaning that it sucks the sap out of the plants. And as you can see from this particular image, it does look like areas where the insects are feeding tend to be discolored or stressed. Occasionally, you get very heavy infestations of these scales that coat the entire um, leaf surface. So again, it's not um, unreasonable to suspect that this herbivore might be doing important things in the system. And just to give you a little bit of feel for the natural history here, um, they're sap suckers, and so they feed kind of like a slurpy straw with this little structure here called a stylet. Um, scales have a very short mobile stage as a juvenile, and then they basically turn into this sort of featureless blob um, where their primary functions are sucking the sap and then converting that energy into baby um, scale insects. I've been a little bit obsessed with this for a while, so I know a little bit. So um, here's a picture of a Spartina stem looking down on it. And um, the baby scales tend to have very limited and short dispersal. So if you're born on a plant, you tend to stay on that plant. And as they age, 
they develop this outer waxy covering. So these are mature females on those lower leaves. And then the babies will crawl out of them and crawl up. And these little orange dots here are the babies. So they have a very short crawler stage. They then hunker down and they start um, sucking their sap from the plant. So what was a little surprising to me is that about 20 years ago, Kathy Boyer and Joy Zedler had hypothesized that the scale might be important to um, marsh restoration. And one of their major observations was that in some of these restoration sites, the plants were much shorter, the Spartina plants, than they were in nearby natural marsh areas. And they also noticed, it, noticed that in those restoration areas where the plants were short, they tended to have heavy infestations of the scale insect, suggesting that maybe this insect was affecting the ability of people to be able to restore some of these marsh um, environments. Um, but nobody had done the, the sort of key manipulations to look at the impact of the scale on the plant. So that's where we came in on the scene. Um, and some of our early work led us to basically suspect that the, the scale insects was, were doing bad things to the plants. And so I wrote a wrap. Um, and this wrap was sort of unique because I wrote it in response to a competition um, by the, the Science Genius Group, which is a collaboration between a professor at Columbia and a rap artist from the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, I, 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 I know that there are other people that do this out there that sort of link science and genius. Um, so I thought that there might be other PIs like me that were submitting raps to this competition. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> So it, it was me against a bunch of mid, middle school um, kids <laughs> and high school kids. So at one level, maybe I would have nailed it because uh, my competition were younger, but uh, I ended up not winning the competition. But I'm pretty proud of the rap. And so you, know, you can let me know what you think later on. So we're going to turn on the mic to make me feel more legit. Check, check. OK. So this is from the perspective of the insect towards the plant. And it's, there's no music, it's just, it's just me acapella. Here we go. You say I'm a sucker, a sap sucker indeed. Piercing you with my stylet, that's how I flow and feed. Like mosquito blood sucking, I'm robbing your juice. Slurping you like a slurpee, ain't no time for a truce. They call me scale insect, M-D-P-E-S-T. And I'm coming for you plants, be you bush, weed, or tree. I'll take away your sap, suppressing your growth. I drop your fruit production, that's a scale bug oath. So what, you got a crew? Hey, I got one too. Picture thousands of us scales all feeding on you. Where's your other bug pests? They've already left. When the tides get those grazers, we'll be holding our breath. I'm like too much TV. I'm sucking your life. I'm like those mean enemies. I'm the source of your strife. So call me sap sucker or herbivore pest. Cause it's true, we can do harm to the plants we infest. That's my rap. <laughs> So, so we, we, we did some initial experiments, so we thought we had it figured out. Um, and we probably could have sort of published a quick paper there, sort of another example of top-down control. Um, but we started to think that salinity might be important to these interactions. So we did some experiments, and then things got more complex, as they often do. Um, and we ended up doing several more experiments. But here's the sort of the next step in the process. To get at the uh, effect of salinity on this interaction, the, the first really sort of crude experiment was to grow plants either in saltwater pools or in freshwater pools. And we also manipulated the presence or absence of these insects. And so this plot basically shows you that we were able to effectively maintain saltier and fresher treatment. Um, and I'll just point out that these were in these pools. So as water evaporated, the salinity tends to rise. And then we would replace the water every few, few days. So that's what's that the, the wiggle there. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say there. This plot shows you that we did effectively manipulate scales. So the data that I'm not showing you are the no scale plants. Those always had fewer than three scales throughout the duration of the experiment. Um, but if you look at the plus scale plants, Initially, we see a pretty big difference between our freshwater and our saltwater plants. So more scales tended to um, be present on um, the freshwater plants. But then that difference disappears um, later on in the experiment. Not really sure why. 
this plot shows you the plant growth, and there are two major things that I want you to take away from this. The first is that, in general, the plants grew better when they were in freshwater environments. And this, I don't know why, but this sort of always melts my mind a little bit. These are plants that are growing in these estuaries, in these salty environments. Um, and so people historically have call, called them things like halophilic. Um, I don't think that that's appropriate. I think salt tolerant is a better term. They grow better in freshwater. This isn't a, no a novel finding, but it sort of reaffirms this pattern that others had seen. But what was most striking is that the scales benefited the plants in the freshwater. Benefited meaning stimulated the above ground biomass to grow more in the presence of scales than in the absence. And we didn't see that effect in the saltwater treatment down here. But of course we want to know what's going on in the field. And so um, my assistants, who named themselves after the organisms they studied, the Haliapsis chaps and the Spartina spartans, went out into the field with very sophisticated scale removal instruments, AKA toothbrushes, and they scraped the scales off of half the plants to create no scale plants, left the scales on other plants, and then measured the performance of marked um, plants through time. And scales did have a negative effect on these plants in the field. So here we have change in shoot height was reduced in the presence of scales. The final um, shoot biomass um, was reduced in the presence of scales. And this effect wasn't significantly different, but there was a tendency for plants, um, fewer plants to produce seeds when they were colonized by scales. And just as another indicator of the negative effect of the scales, it looked like scales speeded up senescence. So when the plants are starting to dry off, uh, die off, um, it happens earlier in the season in the presence of scales. And this is relevant because this sort of later part of the summer is when these plants are flowering and shedding seed. So there's at least the potential that the insect is negatively affecting sexual reproduction. We followed that experiment up with a field study where we not, didn't just manipulate the presence or absence of scales, but we also manipulated salinity by do adding salt to some of our plots. And what's, I think, kind of interesting in this system is we were working in South San Diego Bay, and just a few hundred meters from our field sites is the South Bay Salt Works, where they're harvesting salt from the ocean. So they donated some of the salt to this project, and so I, I give them a shout out as well. We did this experiment at two sites. We manipulated scales. We had elevated salinity and ambient salinity plots. We maintained them through time. Um, there are our two sites. That's the water mark. There's the five. Yep. Um, just ignore the data. Um, OK, so here we, I'm showing you the days to senescence. And we expect if the scales are having a negative impact on senescence, that this should decrease. And so I'm going to walk you from left to right. So at our north site, we did see um, a reduction in the days to senescence under ambient salinity plots. When we added salinity, this effect went away. And then at our southern site, we never saw in either the ambient or the elevated salinity plots um, a positive or a negative impact of the seeding insects. So there's still some complexity and there's still some questions that we're working out, and I'll talk about that in a second. But this is sort of our working model right now. Um, if you look at plant stress and the impact that has on the grazer effects on plant growth, when the plants are not stressed, it looks like they're able to overcompensate. They grow more above ground um, tissue. As the plants get stressed by the salt, they undercompensate, and that's when the herbivore has a negative effect. And then at the extreme salinities way over here, the, it seems that the plants are so stressed out by those high salinities that they no longer um, respond to the herbivore. So I put a question mark here because I'm not too sure about this, but it's a reasonable hypothesis. When you look at where Spartina grows, it can grow in a variety of places, but some places look like this that tend to be dominated by Spartina, maybe even some bare, bare area. Or it grows mixed in these sort of mixed species assemblages. And we have some evidence to suggest that some of the variability we're seeing between our experiments and between our sites is related to this. So we tend to see negative impacts of herbivores when the plants are growing like this compared to growing um, by itself. 
so back to the wrap. I'm not wrapping again at this point in the talk. I will later. Um, when I wrote this wrap, I didn't really appreciate this complexity, but I did include this line, the last line, because it's true we can do harm to the plants we infest. This line, can do harm, notes the context dependency or the potential context dependency, that the harm that the in insect has on the plant occurs under some specific salinity range. Um, so I don't know, I, I sort of fortu fortunate that um, I incorporated that line in the, the last um, line of the wrap. And I just wanted to share this, this brief story because I think it's cool. Um, this is my student, Shelby Reinhart, and she's trying to get me, it's for, I don't know why this is, but I often sort of have these blinders on that think about the plant and the herbivore, and I pretend that they exist by themselves. Um, so she's forcing me to at least take one step back. Um, and here's something called the seaside lady beetle. When I think of ladybugs, I tend to sort of think of beautiful um, passive organisms, but they're very important predators in these systems. And here's maybe evidence of that. This is a scale insect that's basically been chewed apart by one of these lady beetles to get at the soft tissue that's inside. Um, Shelby's done re some really neat experiments trying to get at the lethal and non-lethal impacts of lady beetles. Uh, anybody have an idea how you make a non-lethal lady beetle? Take its jaws off. So those, that's something that's been done in the past. Shelby's, somebody has another, yeah? No? Um, Shelby has decided to use super glue. And so she's taken these beetles, she puts them under a dissecting microscope, and then she glues their mouth parts together. The reason that she does that, oh, I know. <laughs> so tragic, just one beetle. Um, I didn't expect that response. Um, <laughs> so the, the reason that she's doing this is that she's interested in understanding whether or not the impact of the beetles is strictly via the beetles eating scale insects, or whether or not it might be enough for the beetles to be scaring the insects and not eating them. And one of the reasons we're interested in that question in ecology is that a single beetle can only eat so many scales, but a single beetle can scare a lot more scale insects. So as far as the sort of community impact, the um, importance of fear might be really um, strong. So these are some of her preliminary data. And here she's plotting the number of crawlers per stem. So these are the baby juveniles that are hatching out of the mothers, crawling around, and they, the, the dispersal events tend to happen in pulses. So this general pattern is, is not surprising. We see that regularly. Um, in the no beetle treatments, we tend to have the greatest number of scales through time of crawlers. The lethal beetle treatments, they basically suppress crawlers for the duration of the experiment. So they're eating baby scales and they're eating the mother scales that could be making more insects. Um, but there is a suggestion here that there is this fear effect. So those non-lethal beetles with the glued mouth parts, they're walking around, they're creating scales that are producing fewer baby scales. I think it's cool and I just wanted to share that story. We, we still have a lot more work to try to understand what's going on. So I just wanted to show this picture because in the end what we really care about here is trying to understand how these systems work, how they respond to these stressors, and we're also trying to think about how to improve restoration approaches. And this insect um, is thought to be important to restoration success and so we're hoping to um, provide insight there. So now what I'm going to do is a sort of dramatic shift in my talk. We're still talking about stressor impacts, but I wanted to talk about a recent focus in my lab, which is to look at the effects of contaminants on species interaction. So when we think about contaminants and the field of toxicology, we often think about what are called toxic endpoints. So that is you take contaminant A, you expose a single species to it, and then you measure something like the growth, the reproduction, or, or the survivorship of, of those individuals. Um, but we know in ecology that species interactions are super important. So I argue that to really understand the effects of these contaminants, we need a better perspective that includes species interactions, that looks at the effects of exposing entire communities um, to these contaminants. I probably brought this slide up a, a bit too early. <laughs> 
Um, but this term I want to introduce right now is called info disruption. And if we go back to this interaction in the inner title, you've got a predator that might be releasing a cue, presumably unintentionally here. Um, and then you have a prey that might be responding to that cue. So that's normally what's, what's happening. There's some information that's being extracted by the prey um, from the predator uh, present. Contaminants are thought to play important roles because they can impact any of these different stages of this interaction. Contaminants might be affecting the release of the cue by the predator. It might be affecting the solubility of the cue in the seawater or it might be affecting the ability of the prey to detect those cues once they're in their environment. So this idea of info disruption is one that I think is, is potentially important and there's growing appreciation for it. And we've been focusing on copper because it's a common marine contaminant, including in places like San Francisco Bay, San Diego Bay. Um, and in San Diego Bay, it's thought to enter nearly all of the copper in the bay enters via anti-fouling um, tape on boats. And I love this study, and I'll talk about it a couple times in my talk. So this is a study by McIntyre et al. And they were looking at predator avoidance in juvenile coho salmon in response to predatory trout. And when you expose the salmon to copper, that decreases their survival in the presence of these predators, largely because it changes their predator avoidance um, strategy. So one of our hypotheses is that maybe heavy metals generally interfere with um, chemically mediated interactions. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna focus on these two sort of model food webs, not sort of, these are actual model food webs. The one on the left are seaweeds that are being attacked by snails and they're turning their defenses on. We're interested in the effect of contaminants on these interactions. And the second one are looking at rock crabs that might be eating or scaring carnivorous whelks that are eating barnacles. And so we're interested in studying these interactions in the presence or absence of these contaminants. And so we'll start with the seaweed example here. And these are two of my students that have largely been working on this, Alex Warnicke and Emily Jones. And I'm gonna take sort of a broad step back here. We know that stress generally can affect plants. And if we, if we look in the terrestrial literature, there's um, a rich history in studying this concept. And I've highlighted some of the key hypotheses and I'll, I'll sort of go through them to make sure we're on the same page. Um, the plant stress hypothesis here argues that as plants become stressed, they become increasingly vul vulnerable to grazers. So we see increases in grazer density as plants become stressed. We think we see this because as stress happens, proteins and amino acids get broken down. That increases the availability of nitrogen, might be something important for nitrogen limited herbivores. So there's observations to support this hypothesis. There's observations, there are observations to support this one as well, the plant vigor hypothesis, which argues that as plants become stressed, they become less attractive to herbivores, in part because herbivores really like to feed on vigorous, fast-growing, um, healthy tissues. And I actually wasn't sure what to call this hypothesis. I'm not sure if it has a name. Um, but there's another idea that basically says the impact of stress on plants will depend upon their palatability. So if we look at a palatable plant, when the, those plants are not stressed, they're very vulnerable. Grazers will have a strong negative impact. This effect should decrease because as those plants get stressed, they're less yummy. But a defended plant that starts out unpalatable, its chemical defenses might be um, disrupted, um, broken down by the stress, and so they might actually show the opposite pattern. So a very long-winded way of saying that there are a diversity of hypotheses to suspect that stress can affect plants and not necessarily in clear ways for, for any particular system. Um, I'll go through this one quick. Stress may also impact grazers. Okay. We are deciding to, we've chosen to ask the impact of these contaminants on interactions between a plant and an herbivore that involve inducible defenses in seaweeds. So we're working with a seaweed, um, Silvisa compressa, it's a rockweed, 
And there are at least three mechanisms by which the contaminants can impact these interactions. First, it might stress the plant, and so these seaweeds might then lose the ability to turn these defenses on. I don't know that I define an inducible defense. Does anyone need me to define that? No, okay, we're good. Okay, um, another option is that the contaminants can lead to inducer stress. That is, the signal that we think is turning these defenses on is grazing by these snails. So if the contaminants are reducing grazing, it might lead to reduced levels of these defenses. And the third possibility is that maybe the snails that are responding to these defenses might then lose the ability to identify defended from undefended tissues in the presence of the contaminants. So here is our basic approach. Um, and I will say that um, for the past 15 years or so, the field of seaweed inducible defenses has largely focused on laboratory experiments, and I include myself in that um, bunch. Um, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing because what we really care about is what's happening out in the field. And so we're now starting to do these experiments where we're caging seaweeds with and without herbivores with diverse and non-diverse communities and seeing what happens. Um, but just to give you a feel for how these experiments are typically run, we expose our seaweeds either to the presence of grazers or the absence, and that allows the defenses to increase potentially when they grew with grazers, and the ones that didn't should have low levels of inducible defenses. And the way that we assay or measure for these inducible defenses is we do choice feeding experiments with herbivores and let them tell us whether or not there's a difference in the palatability of these food items. So we know that tegula, um, aka chloroptima, is a really important um, inducer in this system. So when the seaweed is attacked by tegula, it becomes way less palatable to future attack by these snails. Um, and my student, Renee Dolkel, who finished, she wrote a rhyme. And this is to um, Kanye West's uh, Stronger. So her version is Responder, and it basically um, talks about these inducible defenses, and, and here's the chorus, if I can remember it. No, 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 that don't kill me, can only make me stronger. I need to induce defenses, cause I can't wait much longer. And enemies come in my way, try to take refuge or try to deter, cause I could change my behavior chemicals or my structure. So that's just a short version, but it basically gives you the idea, I wanna put this down, um, <laughs> that these inducible defenses exist and that they can occur through a variety of mechanisms, including changes in um, behavior, morphology, and chemistry. So we wanted to examine the impact of contaminants on these inducible defenses and we thought that the timing at which contamination occurs might be important. So we divided our experiments um, into two major experiments, and the first one is shown here. That is, we're conducting our induction phase in the presence of elevated copper levels or ambient copper levels. Um, so this basically asks what happens if induction is happening during contamination. We then take those seaweeds in a clean bioassay phase and ask about the relative palatability. And it looks like copper weakens the elicitation of these defenses. So here's our ambient treatment. We're basically measuring the consumption of these seaweeds. Um, the snails strongly preferred the non-grazed tissue. That's something we see repeatedly with these organisms. But when they were previously exposed to copper during that induction phase, that eliminated that preference for non-grazed tissues. So trying to think about the mechanisms by which that might occur, I'm gonna wave my hands a little bit because I don't wanna um, make the talk too long and show you all the data. Um, but we don't think that it's plant stress. Um, and the way that we've addressed that is to look at two indirect measures of are the plant stressed. The first is that there's a group of chemicals in these algae called the fluorotannins. They're very easy to measure as far as a, a class of chemical compounds. We don't see any copper effect on this class of chemicals. Um, the other measure that I'm not showing you but that we have measured is to look at TAM fluorometry. We don't see any evidence that copper stresses the algae. 
So that doesn't mean that there's not a difference in the inducible defenses of these algae, but it at least suggests that they seem to be doing things normally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the other possibility or another possibility is that the contaminants are affecting the inducer, the snails that are potentially turning the seaweed defenses on. There is evidence of that. So here we have the amount of seaweeds that were eaten during the induction phase. It's high under ambient levels um, of copper, but at elevated levels, we see a strong reduction. So that decrease in attack rate could lead to lower levels of inducible defenses. We think that responder stress could also be important here. Um, does anybody know about the elemental defense idea in plants? I like to talk and ask questions. Has anyone ever heard of elemental defense? Okay. So it's basically this idea that plants either actively or passively might accumulate heavy metals from their environment. And even though those heavy metals might be bad for the plants, it could serve a beneficial purpose in that it might make you more resistant to um, herbivory later on. We know that these algae are very good at accumulating heavy metals like copper. And we do see um, evidence of elevated copper levels in our seaweeds that encountered elevated copper. And um, yeah, we have other experiments that sort of further support this idea that elemental defense might be happening um, towards the region. So I said we were interested in the effect of timing. So that last experiment exposed these organisms to copper contamination. Here we're asking a slightly different question. That is, let's pretend that these defenses have already been turned on. Now what happens when you conduct those bioassay phases in the presence of copper? And we see a chart that looks very similar to that earlier one that I showed you. The ambient snails fed um, as expected, that is they preferred non-grazed over grazed tissues. But when they fed upon these defended tissues and undefended um, tissues, they fed equally. So they lost that preference again. And I'm not gonna walk you through this more complicated graph, but what this is meant to highlight is that it looks like this effect is largely via changes in the snails. So exposing just the snails to copper can basically cause them to lose their ability to choose the correct um, food. So for the second part, um, it's possible that the plants were becoming stressed during the bioassay phase. We don't think that that's maybe too likely given that it's a shorter exposure period. The inducers aren't being stressed in the second experiment, so that's not relevant. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that that responding snail that encounters defended and undefended tissues is now losing its ability to distinguish them um, from each other. So is this such a bad thing um, to not be able to recognize defended from undefended tissues? To ask that question, I set up sort of the extreme worst case scenario. That is, what if you're a snail and you're forced to feed on only one of these types of silvicia, ungrazed, grazed, or to be starved entirely? So we marked juveniles so that we could measure per, uh, performance such as growth. And the snails that were fed the grazed silvicia um, grew less than the snails that were fed non-grazed silvicia. Starved snails don't grow. We also saw a negative effect on um, gamete investment. So this is the proportion of snails that we could assign either to having no gametes, low gametes, or high gametes. Those that are fed the grazed silvicia have a greater proportion of those without gametes, a lower proportion that have high gametes. So um, we think that this could be problematic for these snails. And so here's sort of a traditional slide summary for these results. Um, tegula induces these defenses in silvicia that lower the palatability. Copper contaminants appear to interfere with these interactions largely by changing the behavior of the snails. And this change in behavior could be bad for tegula as far as performance. So that's the long-winded summary of that. Here's the short um, version. Um, and this is from a group of high school students that we've been working with in San Diego. And um, one of the things they did last year was to partner with graduate students, including my student, Alex. And they wrote this rap um, to Thrift Shop by Macklemore. And they said, 
Contaminants are bad. Coffee's gone messing with the seaweed system. I, I'm munching. Tissues are digested. So copper slows consumption. Um, so, yeah, that's. So, there's, I think there's power in this approach because in very few lines, I think they've captured some of the essence of the research that we're doing here. But the other power in this approach is that we're working now with students like this group from um, this high school in, in um, Imperial Beach in San Diego, where they have underrepresented students. And so one of the problems science and ecology in particular has faced is trying to recre recruit these students into science. Um, I think there's power in the approach because many of them are unfamiliar with the language of science, but they're familiar with the language of hip hop. And so you go and you show them that they can talk about science through hip hop, and I think that there is evidence that's emerging um, to suggest that this is working in, in, in really empowering these students to consider careers in science. Okay, so the last example I'll talk to you about is one maybe geographically a little closer here. This is work done by my student Chris Kwan in San Francisco Bay, and he's been interested in the impact of these tritrophic interactions in San Francisco Bay and how copper affects those interactions. So this should come as not a surprise to anyone in the room. Predators are scary and they eat things. And if we look at their impact as far as eating things, we can talk about their consumptive effects on the community. As far as scaring prey, we can talk about their non-consumptive effects. Over the past 20 years in marine systems, there's been an emerging, increasing appreciation for the role of fear, for the role of these non-consumptive effects in, in these um, environments. And one of the um, reasons that I think it's really important to identify the effect size of these um, effects relative to each other is that how energy and nutrients moves through these food webs really depends upon how predators are impacting these communities. And so when we think of um, things like heavy metal, we might think of something like this. Um, heavy metal sometimes has scary imagery. Um, but in ecology, it looks like heavy metals actually weaken the effects of fear. So sort of take this picture out of your mind because um, it looks like what we're seeing is something like this. So this is that McIntyre et al. study. And what it shows is these fish, when they're uncontaminated, they're not exposed to the contaminants, they respond strongly to predators. You expose them to copper and then they lose the ability um, to respond to the predators. Another way to talk about it is maybe predators become less scary if it's a dangerous thing if you're a prey. So here's the basic approach for these experiments. Um, I'm gonna walk you through it now so that maybe you appreciate the data later on. So we're working with this tritrophic system, crabs eating snails that are eating barnacles. Um, we might have one, we did have one treatment that had basically snails and barnacles together. If we wanna get it the consumptive effect, that is what is the effect of, of crabs eating snails? We set up um, a culling treatment where we basically at a regular rate that's realistic, we took the snails out as if they were being eaten by their predators. Can anyone think of why we wouldn't have crabs feeding in this treatment to get at just the consumptive effect? Yeah, so those crabs that would be eating them would also be scaring them. And so the reason we set up these experiments like this is so we can look at the consumptive effect independent of the non-consumptive effect. So the non-consumptive effect, snails eating barnacles, they're exposed to predator cues. And then to look at the total effect of the predators, we can combine them. Ah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure how to address that question. So um, what I will say is that that effect at least is the same between our sort of predator treatment. Um, but that's an interesting one. Um, one, of this, one of the things you're going to see shortly is that I don't know that it's so much them responding to us but they, str they strongly respond to each other. Um, so keep that in mind. 
Um, to, to get at this question about how contaminants might affect these different effects, we needed to first ask the top question, and that is, do crabs scare these snails? Um, obviously, that's important to the questions we want to ask, but it's important in this system because there's previous evidence that this particular snail species doesn't respond to some predators under some situations. Um, so to test that, we did a field experiment where at three sites in San Francisco Bay, we um, put out these containers like this. And unfortunately, I'm not going to show you the inside of them because we didn't take a picture of the inside. But in each one of these tubs, we have either the um, a, a non-lethal crab. And here, to create a, a non-lethal crab, we basically put a mesh barrier. And so they're allowed to eat snails on one side. And then we measure the impact of those cues on the other side of that mesh. So we've got snails feeding on barnacles. Some of our cages have crabs in them, and some of them do not. And overall, we did see a significant effect of those crab cues that lowered the consumption um, of the barnacles by the whelks. OK, so that was just to sort of demonstrate that this is a system worth asking these questions in. And whether or not heavy metal weakens fear, we did some preliminary lab experiments. And we only found this effect at the very high copper levels. At 100 parts per billion, we saw that the snails stopped responding um, to those predators. What we, uh, I, I shouldn't say that. An, an obvious next step would be to go into the natural environment and deploy contaminants. Um, that's not something that most people are willing to permit us to do, probably for the best. Um, so unfortunately for these experiments, we've had to come back to the lab. And we have set up these mesocosms where we've got upstream compartments with crabs or without that are feeding on con uh, conspecific snails. The effluent from that flows into a downstream compartment with our snails and our barnacles. And then we recirculate that. And we manipulate a variety of factors, copper, no copper, crab, no crab, and then we also um, deploy the culling manipulation. And I'll first walk you through the um, no copper uh, data. And here, these two bars are showing you that in the absence of crab, that culling, that is changing the conspecific density, increased the per capita consumption rate of these snails. That was a surprise to us. But there's a rich history, particularly with charismatic vertebrates, that changing densities can lead to change per capita intake rate. But it's usually actually in the opposite direction. So when we think about these large vertebrates, there's a safety in numbers. Because you're safer with a, a, a higher density of conspecifics, you're allowed to spend more time feeding and less time um, displaying vigilant uh, behaviors. But a lot of marine vertebrates show this opposite pattern, where as their density declines, that's when we see an increased um, feeding rate. And it could be through a variety of mechanisms. So maybe as they're cold, they're not mating as much. They're not interfering with each other. And this last one, I think, is relevant for this snail because there's previous literature to suggest that at times, i.e. when they're not mating, um, they're trying to avoid each other. And so that might be relevant for this particular system. Just like the field study, we saw a negative effect of the crab cues. So in the presence of crab cues, the snails are feeding less, presumably trying to seek refuge. But we were really surprised by this difference over here. So that increase in feeding rate um, that we saw with culling in the absence of copper, that now went away in the presence of copper. And we can take all of these data and collapse them into okay, um, effect sizes. So here we've got the consumptive effect, the non-consumptive effect, and the total effect of the crab predators on these systems. If we just look in the absence of copper, there's a strong negative consumptive effect. You add copper, and that goes away. So one of our working ideas here is that, at least in this system, the contaminants might be decreasing the relative importance of these contaminants, making contaminated scenarios maybe more scary, at least under intermediate levels of copper. 
Okay, so I just want to highlight that for the contaminants, it looks like they are greatly affecting the behavior of these snail species. They're losing their ability to identify the correct food, and they're also losing their ability to interact and respond with um, changes in constitutive density. And this is my last slide. I um, wanted to end on this note because the idea of looking at the effects of stressors is something that I'm interested in and I'm trying to sort of rally support for that, um, including trying to find funders that are um, interested in this idea. But in San Diego, we're surrounded by a variety of estuaries that are greatly impacted by urban development and a variety of stressors. We've got this great lab, although this is my first time here and you guys have a pretty kick-ass lab as well. Um, but we've got a growing number of ecology faculty that are interested and share this interested in the impact in particular of contaminants on uh, communities. And we've got chemists that are doing really sophisticated things like trying to identify emergent and non-targeted chemical con contaminants. Um, and so if people are interested in collaborating on this stuff, I would love to hear about it. If we can get you down to San Diego, um, come on down. Um, but uh, that's the end of my talk, and thank you for your time. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Yeah. So going back to the um, original, the first story that you told, yes. South Carolina. Yeah, uh, um, Spartina. Spartina. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, um, so you had um, originally asked the question based on the differences that you saw in an established native um, population mm -hmm. and then a, a, a restorative situation where they, and you said that they were shorter and, and that was what, where the question came from, yes. but I don't, I didn't, I didn't hear how you answered that. Did you answer to that specific, like why were they different? Was it a stress from salinity differences or? Yeah, so um, the, 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 the reason that I was interested in that question is because there was the suggestion that, there that scales were affecting the restoration success um, in those studies. So I, you know, I don't know okay. back then, but um, what would be interesting to find out is the salinity in those restoration slide sites <coughs> because our data, you know, we can use the diversity of our data to zoom in on some of these uh, salinity ranges where we think the scale should have a negative impact, right? So yeah, we can, we've got predictions. Yeah. If, we, if, if we can get you, those, if you can find that optimum, right? Yes. If you draw that graph, you find the optimum, yes. then you can say yeah. this would be a great place yeah. to plant this. Yeah. Type, right? So so, um, it, and it actually might work for the for the restoration stuff. Yeah. Um, because we're transplanting into areas without plants usually. The problem is that I, you know I can't give you an absolute value necessarily because the effect of competition I think is really important. So that's going to shift those absolute values. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. So after you exposed the snails to the copper and you showed um, pretty um, strong effects of their grazing behavior, did you take those same snails and No, they're, they're, they're not doomed. Um, there, there was a, a slide that I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on where it was oh. chronic and acute exposures. So we did some acute exposures um, for a day and then said, okay, well, what happens if you feed for four, four days um, in the absence of the contaminant? And those snails appear to be able to feed fine. So it's, it's when you're chronically exposed that you lose this ability to distinguish. Yeah. And <clears throat> given these systems, that's probably the most likely context. I mean, you don't, I imagine you don't see copper going up and down strikingly within the bay. They're yeah, so, right, so um, in San Diego Bay, for example, there are particular areas that are predictably high. Um, rainfall is very low. Um, and there are some places because of the, the bent of topography, you get low circulation. And so you do tend to find areas where the copper doesn't vary greatly through time. So, so where I was headed with that is that 
you've gone from the lab to the field, which I totally applaud in this, and it sounds like you're just moving into the field, yes. but you're looking at, at, as you look at the succession of the system, you're looking at the later life stages of all three critters, mm -hmm. and we know fucoids don't do well at the recruitment stage to copper. Mm -hmm. So once you get through this, you still have to deal with the replenishment of all the populations, and it may in fact be that at one point, this effect ecologically goes away, sure. because you no longer have the prey recruiting in the first place. Sure. Um, yes, I recognize that for sure. So I mean, yeah, that's asking about the variability. Yeah, so um, what, I know this doesn't really help me answer your question, but um, an well, important. I didn't even have a question. Okay. <laughs> well, so an, an, an important um, new system that we're starting to work with is, is sargassum, and sargassum is very abundant in some of these contaminated areas. Um, and we know that sargassum shows these these blue cuts. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I recognize that copper can have dramatic effects as well. That's why that's the spatial spatial heterogeneity is my question. It's spatially heterogeneous, yeah. then the bay itself yeah. Yeah. would respond differently throughout the bay. Yeah, so yes. very, very good. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these uh, things I'm assuming are waterborne cues. What happens at that low tide when you see spanker? Do you see kinds of things? You have, you have Theus, or you know these things feeding up and on the farms when the high inner tidal when they're high dry. Do you kind of see the same kinds of things when they're dry? Um, so maybe I'll start with the last example of crabs scaring whelks that are eating barnacles. Um, there are some tests of this, um, and I read one recently. Um, about whether or not the predators can be scary at low tide. So the predators presumably are staying in the water, yeah? Um, the snails maybe are still feeding in the absence or as the tide goes out. Um, there's some evidence from a marsh study that having a crab in water can change the behavior of snails that are out of water. So the chemicals might be going volatile. I don't think that there's a lot of evidence of that. Um, this has been an important criticism of some of the studies because if you're taking intertidal organisms and exposing them to crab cues 24 hours a day, you might be really sort of overestimating the impact of those, those cues for sure, for sure. Yeah, Scott. Well, thinking about how the copper might be modifying, or modifies the behavior of the grazers, do you know much about the Mechanism, sort of molecular cellular level by how it's happening, impairing the neurotransmitter or something. You know, does anyone have any clues on how that? Um, there, we we don't have a clue for our species in our systems yet. Um, I'm not too sure what else I can say. I think there is evidence to suggest that the, the chemoreceptors are being impaired, and I'm not too sure at what level that's happening. Um, I'm mostly certain not for copper, but for ocean acidification, where they've done, you know, like the film and day stuff, um, that there's not a morphological change in the chemoreceptors. So it's some biochemical effect. Um, and, and that's that's what I know. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Yeah.